I'm an environmentalist, but I'm not miserable. <laughs> now, a number of people may be sitting there thinking, how dare he suggest that environmentalists are miserable? But I had an experience last week which kind of shook my view of how the world sees people like me and perhaps us. I um, took part in a debate in London last week where I live, um, which was the Neo-Malthusians versus the Cornucopians. It sounds like a rather bad non-league football clash. But, um, but actually, it was a really interesting debate because you had a professor of earth sciences from a major university in the UK talking about many of the statistics we've seen today about the challenges that we face in terms of resource scarcity. And of course, the insight there is that growing population will lead to quite significant tightening of resources in the developing world that will be quite catastrophic in terms of people's living standards, and in the developed world, even very challenging for us, wars and everything else. And then we had a cornucopian who has pretty much the, the most opposite view that is possible, which is that human ingenuity will solve everything, and that we shouldn't be talking about the negativity of growth, the negativity of population growth, because all of that will actually help us use resources in a more efficient way, such that we can uh, you know, grow our way out of this problem. Now, I'm not a cornucopian, but it was really interesting for me that the room, the energy in the room on that day was essentially with what he was saying, because it's positive, because it's optimistic. And I think one of the challenges that we have as environmentalists is that we often so much talk about the negativity that we don't perhaps get the emotional response that we need from people. So my, my passion is to tell a positive story about the environment, about water, about the role of business in tackling some of the very big challenges that we face. And I wanted to start with one um, data point, which we haven't touched on so much today, which is around the growth of the middle class. So today, there's about 2 billion people in the middle class in the world, largely in Europe, the US, uh, Japan, to a lesser extent, certain parts of Asia. By 2030, that's 19 years, we're going to have 5 billion people in the middle class, 3 billion more. And I'd like to say, first and foremost, that that is a brilliant opportunity for humanity. Because so many people who are currently living quite difficult, quite challenging lifestyles, who don't enjoy the quality of life that you or I have, will be able to do some of the things that we are able to do every day, to perhaps go and have a coffee in the morning to maybe eat meat once or twice a week, perhaps to travel a bit for vacations. And we should be celebrating the ability of resources to enable people, particularly in some challenging places at the moment, to have a much better quality of life. Now, I work for a big company, and companies, I think, are instinctively a little bit cornucopian. Because we exist because we turn resources into services and products that people enjoy. My company's a brewer. Uh, we brew beer or have partnerships in 70 countries around the world about 12% of the global beer market. And our growth and our valuation depends, actually, to a significant extent, on the opportunity of those emerging and developing markets and consumers having a better quality of life and being able to enjoy beer at the end of the day. But I think there's a great opportunity for companies to bridge from the optimism of human ingenuity to the real challenge of resource scarcity that we see around us because the challenges are significant. And so I'd like to talk about how a paradigm shift within business can actually start to deliver some of the resource efficiency we need to enable those extra three billion middle-class people to enjoy life in the same way that we enjoy life. But before I um, do that, I wanted to talk about a different paradigm shift, a paradigm shift in terms of how we understand the environmental issues. Because we've been talking about resources running out for ages. In the 70s, we talked about oil running out. In the 80s, we talked about rainforests. In the last five years or 10 years, we've been talking more about water scarcity. And the last couple, we've talked about soil stability and the lack of phosphorus and what that might mean for us. But we always talk about them as single issues. And we need to begin to think about them in a much more integrated way. So I want to talk about the food and water and energy nexus. Because to be able to have the food that we need for those extra three billion middle-class consumers, we will be using a huge amount of energy in terms of fertilizer and distribution to get that food to people. Of course, agriculture also uses a huge amount of water. But we can't actually have clean water without energy because we need energy to treat it and pump it and move it around. And also, we can't have clean water if we don't sort out how we grow food because of the pollution that we get from agriculture. And we also need water for energy, for our cool our generation systems, and if we are ever going to make anything useful and productive out of biofuels, of course, they need to become much more water and energy efficient. And so we need to begin thinking in this triangle of the water and energy and food nexus. 
And so when I look at a business like mine, there are great resource efficiency gains to be had here. Our target is to, on water, over a 2008 base, reduce our water use per litre of beer by 25% by 2015. That's a reduction of about 20 billion litres of water use. We're on track to get there. Our target by 2020 is to reduce our carbon emissions per litre of beer by 50%. We're on track to get there. And we'll actually, by 20, probably beyond 2020, go significantly further beyond. And what that will enable us to do is grow our products, grow our volume, be able to meet the needs of those additional growing middle class without an increase in our own operations in the environmental impact. And that's why we need to see the water and food and energy nexus not just as a spiral of risk, but also as a spiral of opportunity. Because if you look in the brewing sector, the way that we make stuff is we heat and cool liquids. So if you can actually reduce the amount of liquid you're putting through the system, if you can become more water efficient, you can reduce your energy use. And if you can take your organic waste products and turn them into renewable energy through using the wastewater or using spent grains to create energy, then actually you're using less fossil energy. And so we can have a significant impact through hitting the targets that we are going for. And businesses all over, not just the consumer product sector, but chemicals and engineering and all sorts, have similar stretching targets. But the best part of it all is that actually that makes us quite a significant amount of money. Because until we'd done the analytics, until we'd really challenged ourselves to understand how would we reduce energy use or carbon emissions by 50% by 2020 per litre of beer, we hadn't realised perhaps the extent to which we could really push and stretch ourselves. And there is significant reduced operating costs for us there as an opportunity. And businesses are doing this in quite significant ways around the world, perhaps not talking about it so much yet because they want to get it done first. But actually, there's quite a significant positive change. But I also wanted to talk about, because it's not enough just to do it in your business, I also wanted to talk about what we do in our supply chains. And we as a business, how we buy farming materials like barley and hops and maize from around the world. And we have quite extensive programs with farmers to get them to think differently about what they do in terms of their environmental impact. So in Idaho, we work with the Nature Conservancy with barley farmers. And in the first year of our pilot project there, uh, to get the very large irrigation booms more efficient, we reduced water use by 20% for the same barley output. Across Africa, we have quite an aggressive strategy to offset and, and replace the barley, bizarrely, that's imported from Europe to make beer for middle-class African consumers, and instead use local crops like sorghum and cassava to make high-quality products, lower in price, that also create jobs for around 40,000 smallholder farmers. There are significant opportunities there. But we can't do it without very significant help from governments. And it may seem a bit weird, businesses calling on governments to be more active in terms of their value chains. But there are some things that are significantly undervalued, like water, that we need governments to help us in terms of pricing more effectively, in a fair way, in our value chains, such that we pay a price for our raw materials that includes that resource scarcity. And I'll give you an example. In South Africa at the moment, we, have, we pay about half a dollar for a meter cubed of water to make beer. And our farmers, who grow the crops we then use to make that beer, pay about 2% for the same volume, 2% of that, an incredibly small amount, and no economic incentive to become much more efficient. So how can we, as a series of businesses working with government, actually get resource economics much more integrated into the price of what we pay for products? Now, there's a challenge there for government, which is that um, because government works in silos, much of this is very difficult to get into policy. Government typically sets resource strategy for water and for energy and for agriculture separately. And so what you get are conflicting policies that for a business or an NGO or anyone else in the country actually create quite a lot of challenges in terms of hitting that, the, the answers to that water, food, energy nexus. And one country that, that I know has a water department that says there's no more water available for irrigation has an agriculture department that says we're going to double irrigation to improve food security, and has an energy department that says we're going to develop new, big new biofuels plantations to give us low emissions transport fuel that's going to be irrigated. And that country faces quite significant climate challenges. That can't be done. All of those outputs simply can't be achieved because we need much better joined up policy. And businesses and NGOs we need to work together to support that. So businesses can work internally and become dramatically more efficient, and it can often make us money. Businesses can work with governments and directly with our suppliers to make quite big shifts in the resource use in our supply chains. But we also need to look very locally around the ge geographies in which we operate, where we brew beer and bottle soft drinks. 
to see how we can build coalitions to tackle the water, food, and energy nexus in a very local way. And that's where the role of NGOs is so critical. In the past, NGOs have been brilliant at challenging business to help us put issues on the table that perhaps we hadn't thought of. You know, the climate change was an NGO campaign for 10 or 15 years before businesses really started to listen. On water, perhaps it was one or two years before business started to listen. But there's also, I think, a very big opportunity for NGOs to help build trust in partnerships on the ground to start to actually resolve some of the environmental challenges. And I wanted to give you three quick examples of what we are doing um, with farmers, with WWF, and with other partners to try to tackle some of these resource challenges through the water, food, and energy nexus on the ground. So the first one I want to talk about is working with WWF and working with the German government through a partnership called Water Futures. And it's a partnership that works in Tanzania, in South Africa, in Ukraine, in Peru, and with other partners in India, in the US, in China, and Honduras. And it's about understanding how do we protect the watersheds that, that we're a part of as a business, because we have a shared risk, and therefore a shared responsibility, to protect those watersheds for our own use, for communities, and for ecology. It's not just the old phrase of enlightened self-interest for business. It's actually a genuine, common, shared risk, and therefore a shared approach. And so we have those partnerships active around the world, very different in different places, the particular solutions, to seek to resolve the long-term risk for those watersheds. A second example is a project that the World Economic Forum is running called the New Vision for Agriculture, which is operating in Tanzania, soon to be in Vietnam, and Mexico as well. Again, on-the-ground projects with many companies involved, with NGOs involved as well, to set some quite aggressive targets in terms of getting much higher agricultural output with a much lower resource input, much lower water use, much lower energy use. And the third is another one on water, the Water Resources Group, which is a group company we're, uh, we're involved in, an organization we're involved in, that others are involved in as well, which again, in countries around the world, in China, in parts of India, in Jordan, in South Africa, in Mexico again, is about helping governments beyond, begin to see how water security underpins their energy security, underpins their food security, and what the most cost-effective way is to achieve both our environmental and our business and our social goals out of integrated resource management. So I think there is significant hope for how businesses and governments and NGOs can work together to actually begin to tackle problems on the ground. But it also has an impact for us as consumers. We have our own personal water, food, and energy nexus. And you've seen some of the statistics in the WWF videos that are here on in YouTube. You know, your coffee in the morning takes about 140 to 200 liters of water to, to grow it and make it. Probably about 100 grams of CO2. A t-shirt takes something like 1,700 liters of water, probably about 11 kilograms of CO2. A beer takes about 30 liters of water to make in the total value chain, mainly in agriculture. It takes about 300 grams of CO2 for a 300 gram bottle. There are quite significant impacts that we have through our lifestyles every day. But we need to see that not as an opportunity to tell people how to do things differently, but an opportunity to share information with them and engage with the psychology of consumers, particularly millennials, young people between 15 and 30, who can start to think through how in a fun way they can actually engage in resolving the resource challenge. And this is one campaign that will launch next year. It's based in China. It's called Thirst, but it will be a global campaign. And it's first and foremost informing people about the impact of their water use. And you can engage in this site in all sorts of ways to understand those different products. But beyond that, there's then a whole range of different tools and competitions that we will launch that will help people compete to live a slightly more resource-efficient lifestyle, compete to win prizes and points and everything else, to see the psychology of a sustainable lifestyle as a much more attractive thing. So let's, instead of being seen as miserable, environmentalists. Let's make sure we are environmentalists who are prepared to challenge ourselves and to change in business, change our paradigms to become much more resource efficient. As governments change our paradigms to actually get policy working in a much more integrated way. In NGOs, change our paradigms, and I would say WWF is a leader in this, to understand that we need to both challenge and then collaborate with business to help deliver real solutions on the ground. And as citizens, find out how we, and consumers, find out how we can actually understand and then engage in our own consumption decisions to make sure that we, alongside 4.9999 other billion middle-class people, can actually have a high-quality lifestyle when we get to 2030. Thank you.